Welcome to Pop Culture Legends, a mini series from Digital Dissection, a nerd podcast. Pop Culture Legends explores the spaces in between mainstream and esoteric across the world of media. There's a lot to unbox across video games, movies, TV, and comic books. We hope you enjoy the spaces in between those spaces. Today's legend explores the life and times of George Reeves, the second live action Superman. Reeves' career as a son of Krypton spanned a memorable seven years, but the actor's death in 1959 proved to be a mystery that many are still trying to solve. We explore Reeves' life and the lasting legacy of his work, as well as the night his life came to a controversial end. George Reeves was born George Kiefer Brewer on January 5th, 1914 in Woodstock, Iowa to Donald Carl Brewer and Helen Lesher. Shortly after his birth, his parents would separate and George would move with his mother to Kentucky, Illinois, and later Pasadena, California. While there, his mother would remarry a man named Frank Basolo, who would formally adopt George at 13 years old. George then took his stepfather's name, becoming George Basolo. Sadly, he'd never see his paternal father ever again. Pasadena would be the platform George needed to begin his journey into performance and acting. Pasadena Junior College would be George's choice of furthering his education. He would focus on a cappella choir, guitar, and school plays as a student. It was here that he would gain the skills needed to join the Pasadena Playhouse in 1935, a now legendary state theater. Of its alumni and players, you might recognize a few. Al Pacino, Leonard Nimoy, Dustin Hoffman, and even Ariana Grande. At the Playhouse, George would be a major player in dozens of productions for the next four years. He would eventually be noticed by David O. Slesnick, a scouting agent for Hollywood, and this would lead to him starring in 1939's Gone with the Wind. The Clark Gable-led blockbuster would go on to shape pop culture for decades and George had the distinction of appearing very close to the beginning of the film as Stuart Carlton, a minor role, but one seen by many, many people. In working with Warner Brothers for Gone with the Wind, George would also have two very important things happen. One, he'd be contractually obligated to dye his hair. And two, he would now be known officially as George Reeves. His contract officially stated, In the name of George Bessolo, who plays Brent Tarleton in Gone with the Wind, has been changed by Warner Brothers, to whom he is now under contract, to George Reeves. There are many more stops in Reeves' career from this point on, from B-movies of the era, enlisting in the U.S. Navy, and taking a shot at filming westerns. While Reeves straddled stardom several times, high-paying roles began drying up. His contract with Warner Brothers would be mutually ended, and similarly, another with 20th Century Fox. Without many options and several movie studios slowing down post-World War II, Reeves turned to manual labor and low-budget or independent films of the time. In 1951, however, Reeves' most well-known role would materialize in a new television series called The Adventures of Superman. After balancing TV and radio performances in New York, he would return to Hollywood. While reluctant to initially sign on to be Superman, Reeves would take part in Superman and the Mole Men. The film would act as a two-episode pilot for the TV show, and not long after its completion, the TV show itself began filming. Due to the contract he had signed on to portray Superman, the schedule meant being on retainer with a fairly restrictive timeline. His new agreement included a clause that required him to be available with only four weeks notice. It's important to mention that here, Reeves' career in film became next to impossible to continue pursuing. The demands of playing Superman and the aforementioned contract meant that Reeves had a commitment on his hands that would endure until 1958. 
while he knew very little of Superman to start this new era of his career, he would later come to appreciate and augment his income by making appearances as the character. Reeves took his portrayal of Superman seriously, refusing to smoke cigarettes in character, and generally being a good role model to young fans of the series. Reeves' legacy as Superman was that of giving kids someone they could look up to, and creating a show right for that audience. In an interview with Independent Long Beach, George would state, Our idea is to give the children good entertainment without all the guts and blood and gore. We think the series should teach them something too. That's why I decided to do this. Reeves' time as Superman would be incredibly well received by fans, producers, and critics alike. His warm yet powerful portrayal of Clark Kent and Superman made him a national icon. The show was successful, but Reeves would go on to take issues with playing a one-dimensional do-gooder, and it would eventually lead to a demand for higher salary after the show's second season. Despite this pay raise, by the end of his time as Superman, he was in a difficult financial situation in 1958 after a divorce. The Superman TV show was over at this point in time, and despite several conversations, the revival was on the horizon. Reeves would not return to the role. Attempts to return to film would not go well. Reeves tried to produce his own films and could not secure financing. Despite an incredible reputation in TV and film, a good public image, and national recognition, a career with many twists and turns began sunsetting yet again. On June 15th, 1959, Reeves returned home after going out to dinner with friends William Bliss, Robert Condon, Carol Von Ronkel, and his fiancée, Lenore Lemon. After an impromptu party began, witnesses claimed that Reeves left his guests behind for the rest of the evening. At around 12.30 a.m., a gunshot rang out from his bedroom, with Bliss being the first to investigate what had happened. George was dead. A 30 caliber Luger was found on the floor beneath him, and tests would later determine that he had a blood alcohol level of 0.27 at the time of death. When police arrived, they discovered several clues that continue to be questioned to this day. A spent shell casing was found under his body. There were no powder marks found on Reeves, and the entrance and exit wounds did not line up with where the bullet ended up in the wall. After two investigations and having his body examined, authorities determined that Reeves had committed suicide. This was their official explanation, despite additional information that Reeves had several fresh bruises and that no fingerprints were recovered from the gun. Two additional bullets from the 30 caliber Luger were found in the floor. But according to all witnesses in the home, only the single gunshot was ever heard. Complicating the matter further, rumors from Fred Crane, a personal friend of Reeves, told media that William Bliss made claims later that implicated Lenore Lemon. Shortly after the shot rang out, Lemon ran downstairs to tell others at the home this statement. Tell them I was down here. Tell them I was down here. Reeves' mother, Helen Lesher, refused for many years until her death that George was not capable of killing himself. Her belief led to the previously mentioned second investigation, enlisting high-profile lawyer Jerry Geisler to find out if anything was missed with the initial findings. This is where the discovery of bruises on George's body were discovered occurring on his body and head. With this knowledge, however, the Los Angeles Police Department's ruling of suicide remained as the official cause of death. In the wake of Reeves' death, many theories have been brought up and continually referenced as possible explanations for what occurred that evening. In the years following, Fred Kane continued to tell the story that Lenore Lemon was responsible shooting Reeves after they had argued an entire evening before his death. 
According to the house witnesses, they had been at odds throughout their dinner, and this led to Reeves going to bed early. In this scenario, Lemon is implicated as the only person near Reeves at the time of his death. The second explanation involves MGM Vice President Eddie Mannix, as it was discovered that George and Eddie's wife, Tony, had been having an affair. Mannix was widely known as a fixer in Hollywood, keeping secrets of celebrities quiet. This led to widespread rumors of his potential mob involvement, connecting Reeves' death to a contract for hire plot initiated by Mannix. This theory would influence Sam Kashner and Nancy Schoenberger's book, Hollywood Kryptonite, covering the case. In odd sense of irony, the 2006 film Hollywoodland would provide a fictionalized version of the events of Reeves' death. There are several aspects of his life that the film takes liberties with, but largely focuses on the same possibilities we've already mentioned. Regardless of how Reeves' life ended, the details involved, whether factual or rumors, paint a picture that many Hollywood stories try so hard to be. It's a combination of facts, the data that could be true, and just enough to sound possible. While George Reeves' life may have ended in controversy, his impact on pop culture and the property of Superman are still felt to this day. He gave a life to the role that inspired young fans and adults who tuned in to see the positive lessons the show taught to its viewers. With a life and career that had many ups and downs, Reeves managed to stay a positive influence on screen and made it a point for it to be that way. In George's own words, we'll leave you with this quote. You can, if you think you can. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Pop Culture Legends, a digital dissection miniseries. Be on the lookout for future episodes as we explore the relative unknown, as some of pop culture's stories lie just outside mainstream periphery. If you like the story, why not like, subscribe, and comment as part of the Digital Dissection community. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as our dynamic content on YouTube. Tell us what you think. We'd love to hear from you at digitaldissectionpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, keep on dissecting. And in George's memory, knock the T off Kant. <laughs>